Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we love you, we praise you, we honor you. We thank you for your presence, Lord. Let this be the beginning of a great service and a great sermon. This is a message from you that I'm delivering to these people. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, it says this. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Blessed is the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they'll inherit the earth. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they'll be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they'll see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you falsely and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way that persecuted the prophets who were before you. What I just read to you, no doubt you recognize, is called the Sermon on the Mount. And if you could just imagine for a moment who the audience was, it might help you to understand it. These were Jewish peasants living out and about under Roman rule. Think for a sec how you as a Canadian would feel if either America invaded and took British Columbia or for that matter, if Russia or China should invade. And that's the situation that was going on in this country. And the citizens of that country were poor and they were downtrodden. The best of the land went to the Romans. The taxes went to the Romans. The goodness and the fat of the land went to the Romans while the Jews were being persecuted tremendously. And so to this poor mess of people who were suffering under the worst that Rome could dole out, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He said, look, don't worry about what's going on down here. You've got somewhere else you're headed, and Rome doesn't control it. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Roman soldiers killed, murdered so many people. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they'll inherit the earth. His point here was, it's not going to be a social uprising. Just relax. Let God handle it. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they'll be filled. We'll come back to that one in a moment. Blessed are the merciful, for they'll be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they'll see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted 
because of righteousness. At a number of times throughout Jewish history, it became illegal to worship God. So much so that entire families were slaughtered and put to death if one of their members was found to be worshiping the true God. Blessed are those that are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you falsely for, and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. That last little line, because of me, is extremely important. It's not just blessed are you when people call you names. Blessed are you when people persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you. You could be a jerk and you may deserve it. It's blessed are you when all of that happens because you're standing for the gospel because of Jesus. Rejoice and be glad as great is your reward in heaven. Well, come with me to verse 6 for a moment. It says, Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Hunger and thirst after righteousness. I remember when I read this as a kid, even back then, I thought to myself, I'm hooped. What does he mean? Hunger and thirst after righteousness. I was just interested in girls. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you girls know what I'm talking about. You are interested in boys. And so when you come to something like this, you say, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. That was the furthest thing from my mind. I was interested in everything else, but I, I, I had no particular interest in, in, in righteousness because I assumed that it, it, it meant that I had to be perfect And I had to hunger and thirst after being perfect, and I didn't, and I couldn't, and I couldn't make myself. But when you begin to study righteousness, you come to a better understanding of what the Lord is saying. Take your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. We're going to walk a little bit through the book of Romans this morning. In Romans 1, 16, it says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness that's by faith from first to last. As it's written, the righteous will live by faith. See, that was never my concept as a child. My concept as a, as a child was very much as I was raised. If you do something wrong, you get a slap on the hand. And I always felt that to be righteous meant I had to get it right all the time. Otherwise, God was going to slap me around for some reason. But it turns out, for in the gospel, a righteousness from God. Now he's not only saying if you'll hunger and thirst after righteousness, but he's offering to give you that righteousness. To apply it to our flawed lives. In the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness that's by faith from first to last. What does that mean? It means it's not by your works or your actions 
or your deeds. It's by what you believe. Now let me tell you something. If you believe right, your actions will be right. If you believe wrongly, your actions will be wrong. But it's by what you believe. And your faith in God from first to last. You see, in Jewish circles and in many Protestant circles, there are so many people who have added to the Word of God. You believe God and you do this. Sometimes they demand that you fast. Sometimes they demand that you eat only a certain kind of food. Sometimes they demand that you pray for this length of time or that length of time. And while all these things might be good and all these things might have their place, they have nothing to do with what God has done for you. Our righteousness is not in our performance. Our righteousness comes from His performance. He died on that cross. He paid the price. He ministered to us righteousness. And all we have to do to receive it is believe it. It comes through faith from first to last. In Romans chapter 4, it says this. You can turn with me. Romans chapter 4, verse 1. It says, What then shall we say that Abraham our forefather discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about. Uh, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Now when a man works for his wages, or when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man that does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited to him as righteousness. You know, my wife got a tremendous birthday gift this year. Serb had finished, or was finishing. The pandemic was raging. And right smack in the middle was my wife's birthday. And wouldn't you know it, the American government sent her a check for a lot of money. Hey man. And it arrived right on her birthday. And they didn't send it because it was her birthday, by the way. They sent it because they were sending it to all of their American citizens. She had done no work to justify that. She was just born an American. And when you became born again, you have done no work to justify the goodness that comes from that. You have done no work to earn your righteousness. That's a gift of God. As what my wife received was a gift of the American government. And if you're watching, we're grateful. She had done no work. She had not earned it. It was a gift. It took her a long time to accept that. It took me about two seconds. To the man that does not work but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited to him as righteous. Now just think for a second. 
It doesn't say he justifies the good people. It doesn't say he justifies those that do right and those that do well and those that do this and do that. And do the next thing, it says he justifies the wicked. Somebody actually said to me yesterday, I'm such a wicked person. And they meant it. They were not kidding. I'm such a wicked person. Well, praise God. God is in the justification business. And he justifies the wicked. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessing of the man whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. In other words, he practiced circumcision not to bring about righteousness, but as a seal on the covenant of righteousness. What he did followed what God had done. Jump down to verse 13. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be the heir of the, of the world. But through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those that live by the law are heirs, faith has no value and the promise is worthless. Here, here, let me just explain what he's saying. He's saying if you could work your way to heaven, then what's the point of faith? But suppose you couldn't work your way to heaven. Suppose you were handicapped in some way. Or suppose you just didn't have a heart for it. If you couldn't work your way to heaven and it was a workspace system, you're hooped. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring. Not only those who are of the law, but those who are of the faith of Abraham. And he's the father of all of us. In other words, it applies to us. All of us, not just the Jew, but to the Gentile, they must all come to Christ. They must all come to the gospel, Jew and Gentile alike. Verse 18, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said of him, so shall your offspring breed. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. And since it was about a, he was about 100 years old and Sarah's womb was dead, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding God's promise, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he'd promised. That's why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were not written of him alone, but also of us, you and your cars today, righteous and righteousness is accredited to us. To whom God will credit righteous, righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus, our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. The whole point of this passage is, listen, this righteousness does not come from your works. It comes from your believing in Jesus. Now, some of you might say, well, my, my life is not exactly right. I know there are some areas, yes, and the more you believe in Jesus, the more he will encourage you to get those areas straightened out. He does not encourage us to live in sin. But our righteousness doesn't come from our perfect behavior. 
In Romans chapter 5, verse 15, it says this. Romans 5, 15, the gift is not like the trespass. For if many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that comes by, that, by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many? If by one man's sin, death flowed to many, how much more will it be the righteousness that flows because of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection? Verse 16. Again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one man's sin and bought condemnation. But the gift that follows many trespasses and bought justification. You know, wouldn't it be great if you'd only made one sin in your life? Just one. But that would have been enough to keep you out of heaven. And the point of fact is that we have not made just one sin. It's many trespasses. Not one, many trespasses. And yet the gift of God offers us justification with God because of what Jesus did. Verse 17. For by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man. Through the fall of Adam, Death reigned from dead on. How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through that one man, Jesus Christ? In other words, if Adam could poison the pool, imagine the miracle work of Jesus who could bring cure and health to the pool. Who could make the water drinkable again. Who could change lives worldwide. For the entire length of time it takes for him to come back. Consequently, verse 18, just as a result of one man's trespass was condemnation, all, all men to all men so the result of one man's act of righteousness was justification that brings life to all men for just as through the disobedience of one man the many were made sinners so also the obedience of one man many were made righteous I've actually spoken with people in the past who've said to me things like you know I don't I don't get it I, I don't understand how could what Jesus did back there died 2,000 years ago, how could that make me righteous today? Well, let me explain to you how. The very same way what Adam and, did, Adam and Eve did 6,000 years ago has brought death into the world and you are physically dying as we speak. So what Jesus has done has brought righteousness into the world. And we live because of him. For just as through the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners. So through the obedience of one man, many have been made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace did increase all the more. Where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Isn't that interesting? God didn't come along and say, you know, you are so bad. I, I can't take you. You are so wicked. I, I can't take you. You are so evil. I can never save you. He did not say these things. What he said is, where sin increases, grace increases much more. There is no one beyond the reach of God's grace. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is passage after passage after passage after passage 
chapter and verse over and over and over again. Proclaiming to us that because of Christ's death on that cross, the righteousness that we seek, the righteousness that we must have in order to please God comes from God and is a gift from God to you. I, I just love the fact that he's not waiting for us to get it right. He's not waiting for us to reach perfection. And the moment that you think you've reached perfection, all you've achieved is to lie to yourself. No man is perfect except for Jesus. In his perfection, he went to the cross. In his perfection, he laid his life down. In his perfection, he was raised from the dead. And in his perfection, he has ministered to you his righteousness. The law you couldn't keep, he has kept for you. And now, all it requires from us is that we receive it and believe it and function in it and say, thank you, Jesus. I am now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. His righteousness has been applied to you. Does that make you perfect? No. Will you be perfect? Yes, one day. When? When the Lord comes back. Until then, we're all flawed. So should I go out and sin? Is it okay if I just go out and do what I want to do? No, it's not. Because if you really love God, and if you really have faith in God, and you're really trusting in God for your salvation, you won't go out and do what you want to do. You'll go out and do what God wants you to do. You will apply His will to your life. The Bible says in Galatians, I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness could be gained through the law Christ died for nothing. On the surface that doesn't sound like a very profound, profound thought but just think about what is actually being said there. I don't set aside the grace of God for if righteousness could be gained through the law Think of all the things that you have thought or tried to do in order to be righteous. If any of that worked, if the self-flagellation of the body worked, if starving yourself or feeding yourself, punishing yourself or your family, if any of these rules and regulations worked, then Christ died for nothing. Because if you could attain a measure of perfection, if you could attain righteousness, if you could attain the position to where you are welcomed into heaven without Jesus, then his death was unnecessary. But I have to believe God is not a murderer and would not consign his son to come down and to die if there was a better way. All of the things that I see these various denominations doing, some believe gifts are of the devil, some believe that tongues are of the devil, some believe this, some believe that, some believe something else. Our righteousness does not come by what we do. Our righteousness comes from what we believe. And better yet, in whom we have believed. That's what makes us righteous. 
If we could do something on our own, we didn't need Jesus. Nobody, nobody will get to heaven and say, God, shift over. There's two of us that are perfect. Nobody will get up there and say, give me a seat right beside Jesus because I'm just as good as he is. That's how I got in. Nobody. In fact, when we get to heaven, we'll lay our crowns at his feet. And we'll be eternally grateful that he has saved us from hell. Would you bow your heads with me? Precious, precious Lord, in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father, for a righteousness that does not come from my ability. A righteousness that does not come from who I am, what my pedigree is or isn't, or what I can do or can't do. Lord, you've given me many gifts and talents, but none of them can save me. And so, Father, I thank you for Jesus who paid the price and my salvation is based solely in him. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now you should have with you, and if